power to overcome sin. So before we get into our class, let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. God, we love you so very much. We are so grateful that you love us, that you have compassion on us, that your son came to this earth and was tempted in all points like we're tempted yet without sin so that he can be sympathetic and have compassion on us. We thank you that you are so quick to show us grace and to give us mercy and to be kind to us. We're grateful for this chance we've had to study about your grace this quarter. We pray that it has been helpful and beneficial, and we pray that you've been honored through our study. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. I forgot to get the thing again. Should be one right here. All right. Keeping... Well, that's the wrong topic. All right, so as we've been going through the quarter, we started out by using an analogy of lenses. Sometimes you see the Bible through the lens you choose to look at the Bible through. So if you look at the Bible through a lens of God's justice or His wrath, you tend to get a picture of God that He is someone who wants to pour out wrath on people, and He's just waiting for people to mess up. That is not a good view of God. That's not a complete picture of God. If you look at the Bible only through a lens of grace, you're also going to have a bad view of God because God does expect us to do what He wants us to do. He is a God that gives us chance and chance and chance and chance again and again and again, but does punish those who aren't doing the right thing. So the best way to look at the Bible is to look at the Bible with all the lenses God wants you to look at the Bible with. Look at Him through all those lenses. For instance, you want to look at God with a pair of glasses, seeing His grace and His justice and His mercy and His wrath and His, his uh, punishment at the same time. That's the ideal situation, right? Every time you pick up the Bible, you have these lens and they're, they're calibrated correctly. You're reading the Bible and you're able to get exactly what God wants you to get out of the Bible and understanding who He is. This quarter, what we've done is we sort of set our glasses aside that have both lenses in them, and we picked up the magnifying glass, and we looked at Scripture with the magnifying glass so that we could focus more on God's grace. Because our history has been to focus a lot on God's wrath. Our victory has been to focus a lot on God's punishment, our history. We don't want to get away with that. Now, what we're going to do after our class is we're going to put the magnifying glass back down for a while and put the glasses back on. Because it's not healthy just to have the magnifying glass. That's not the vision God wants us to have. But it's been a healthy thing for us to do this quarter, I believe. Remember when we started out the quarter? We asked, how many of you have ever been in an adult Bible class where the only thing you studied the entire quarter was God's grace, both Sunday and Wednesday? And very few people, I think maybe two people, raised their hands on that particular occasion. Brandon was one of them, raised his hand. Yes, I've been in a Bible class like that. But most of us had never. And some of you have been going to Bible classes I don't want to give away anybody's ages, but you've been going to Bible classes for 50, 60 years. And yet you've never had a class where we focused entirely on God's grace. And I was truthful to you at the beginning when we were making our list of things to study. When grace came up, our first response was, I don't know if there's enough material to cover that all, all, all quarter. And we were going to join grace with another subject. But the more we started looking at it, and I had, Herb and I had the chance to teach the high school class, we started realizing there's probably enough, as Phil has pointed out to me a couple times throughout the quarter, we need a part two. We need, we need another semester where we're talking about God's grace, maybe in smaller classes so we can have more dialogue about how it has changed our life. So that's what we've been doing this quarter, and I think it has been helpful. Today's a review. So if you have... Not been here for the all quarter, you might feel a little left out, but hopefully you'll be able to get some things out of what we're going to be studying today. Before we get any further into it, I do want to say something just so I don't forget. Next quarter, Brian and I are teaching the book of Exodus. We taught Genesis last year. We're teaching the book of Exodus together starting in January, and the syllabus is in the back. And I have emailed the syllabus out to all of you already this morning so, so that you have that information. This is just an overview of the lessons that we've studied. It's not that important that we, we spend a lot of time on this, but our bad news, God's good news, God's grace is efficient, the price of grace, relying on Jesus' grace today, today being the key word, God's righteousness, not mine, grace through faith, not, not law, 
Christ's goodness, not mine, surrendering to God's grace, keeping grace pure, growing in grace, and being God's grace in the world. One of the things he's done in the book that I think is very helpful is at the end of each lesson, he has sort of a paragraph summarizing what we were supposed to learn that week. We've tried to emphasize that at the end of each quarter, but since this is the review week, I thought it would be helpful for us to go back and reread basically the summary, the conclusion, what the author of the material wanted us to get out of it that particular week. So we're going to read all 12 of these. I have different men who are going to be reading these. I'm going to read the first one, and this is our bad news. Some people view grace as the permission to keep on sinning. But we know Romans 6, 1 through 4 says that it is not so. It says, shall we continue to sin so grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid, whatever the case may be. If you, you don't understand the new man and the new life in Christ, if you think you can accept God's grace, be in covenant relationship with Him, and just decide to live however you want. All right, so that was very clear. This class is for those who want to quit sinning who want the power of God to overcome sin because they have realized they can't overcome sin on their own. So God's grace is for those who want to stop sinning and still sin, but God is going to help us overcome those sins. All right, so Larry's going to read the next one there, uh, the second one there. Is it the bad news. Uh, I'm sorry, it should be the bad news. I know. It should be. Oh, yeah. Good, good news. I read bad news. Good yep. news. Yeah, Larry, God, good. God's good news. The bad news is I got myself enslaved to sin and can't quit. The good news is not that God will save me despite my unholiness, but rather it is God is making me holy. He is conforming me to Christ's image. I will be victorious. The gospel really is good news because it says I don't have to be confident in me. I can be confident in him. God has promised that I will overcome sin through Jesus Christ, and I am going to hold on to that promise. All right, very good. So uh, lesson number three, Mike Lodge is going to read that one. If I am to be saved, it will be by God's grace. None of my efforts or strengths is, sig is significant to save me. God's grace, however, is significant. God will use my weakness to drive me to the throne of his grace, giving me strength beyond what I thought possible. I must boast in my weakness and his grace. All right, lesson number four, Joe. The price of grace. Freedom is never cheap in any arena. It always costs sacrifice. God's grace is not cheap. He did not wink at our sins. He paid for them. He paid for them with his son. Every time we sin, we need to see that it takes Jesus' brutal death to pay for that sin. We must not wink at our sins, but rather turn to Jesus and rejoice in God's grace by working out our salvation with fear and trembling. All right, thank you. Brandon, number, lesson number five. Relying on Jesus' grace today. According to John 1, 1 through 18, Jesus Christ is the Word. He is God, and Him is life. His life enlightens us. He does this right now. He is the grace of God in our lives right now. God is not waiting for the judgment to apply His grace by making up for our bad deeds. He sent Jesus to give us life and enlighten us right now. He sent Jesus so we can overcome our bad works and be zealous for good works right now. Let's rely on God's grace in our time of need. Let's rely on Jesus and overcome. All right, very good. Dave Crowder, lesson number six. God's righteousness. Too many Christians think we are served with our good, saved with our good. Therefore, we strive to keep a checklist of laws to convince others that we are good enough to receive eternal life. But this is establishing our own righteousness and will never work. We must not pursue righteousness through law, but instead pursue righteousness through Jesus through faith. All right, instead pursue, pursue Jesus through faith. All right, Mike Allen. Grace, seven. grace through faith, not law. Obviously, we are under Christ's law. If there were no law, there would be no sin. If there were no sin there would be no need for grace. But law cannot save. No law can save, neither the old or the new. Only Christ's grace can save us, not our law keeping. Grace, therefore, is our modification to obey God, not our reward for obeying him. Further, living by faith in God and his grace produces the Spirit's fruit in our lives. 
Against such there is no law. All right, very good. Lesson eight, Daniel. God's power, not mine. Many Christians worry that they haven't been good enough to go to heaven. When we go to heaven, it will not because of our good, we are good enough. It's because Jesus is good enough. It was not because of our good works. It was because of Jesus' good works on the cross. Being saved by grace means having faith in Christ's goodness, not our performance. All right, very good. Uh, lesson number nine, surrender. Tom? Jesus did not use his power to avoid the cross, even though he didn't want to drink that cup. Instead, he surrendered to the Father and was crucified. We can only win the battle against sin if we follow Jesus' example. Instead of using our power, we need to crucify ourselves with Jesus, letting him live in us, surrendering to, surrendering to his grace and the Father's way of escape. All right, very good. Dave? Many people... All right, very good. Phil, lesson 11, growing in grace. Growing in grace. We tend to think grace is God's ability to overlook sin. Rather, grace is God's power to overcome sin. Therefore, we need to depend more and more on him and his grace, both in the face of temptation and in the face of our failures. As we grow in grace, we learn God is working in us, and we will succeed by his power and not our own. Therefore, no matter how many victories we've had, we will continue to rely on God's grace to overcome Thus, our dependence on God's grace grows every day. All right, so lesson number 12, I'm going to read that one. God didn't give his grace simply to save us. He had a bigger purpose in mind. He wanted to make us more like him. He gave us his grace that we may be his grace to others. He was good to us that we may be good to others. He forgave us so that we may forgive others. He was compassionate to us that we may be compassionate to others. He blessed us that we may be a blessing to others. This is the promise of grace. Now, those little summaries are at the end of each lesson in your workbook, but I did print out some extra copies of those where I just put those 12 summaries on one piece of paper front and back. So that would be helpful for you so that you could just go back and remind yourself what each of those lessons were. And I think just reading those summaries for us just for a moment here this morning as everyone was reading them, I found that to be very helpful as it paints the picture step by step of how important God's grace is and how we need to rely on His grace. So with all of that being the summation, hopefully everybody has had the chance to go over the, the questions who have a book workbook. Yeah. And you will now be willing and able to participate and raise your hand. Raise your hand so we get a microphone to you so those in the classroom can listen to you and those online can also listen to you as well. So question number one is this. What are some of the greatest lessons you learned this quarter? What are some of the greatest lessons you were... Anna has a microphone. Go ahead, Anna. That years... That for years I was looking through the wrong lenses. Uh, my thoughts and feelings were of fear and retribution and uh, did not study grace with correct lenses. Okay. All right. Very good. So for years, maybe looking through God's word with a lens of retribution and punishment, and that has caused us to live in fear of God instead of in love of God and respect of God and wanting to serve him for the wrong reason. I think a lot of us can probably uh, say amen to what Anna, Anna just said in some of our life experiences. All right. I think the best lesson for me was the last one, um, and, and the reason is it's informative to understand how God's grace works for us, and that's beautiful, and it helps our hearts, and it helps our peace, but us being God's grace in the world, that's a more powerful lesson personally for me. Don't get me wrong, the power of God's grace taking my sin away is awesome, but realizing the power that us being God's grace in the world has when people view us like we view Christ in terms of, uh, and God in terms of the grace they're offering. And the flip side of that is when we don't offer that grace, it scares me. 
that maybe we are not being the people we need to be. And so, again, the last lesson that we are to be God's grace in the world was the most hard-hitting for me on what I need to be better at. Very good. Thank you. So there's, there's a, I remember one time, a long time ago, I was reading through the New Testament every month. And we read about 10 pages, and I told somebody, somebody found out I was doing that, and asked why I was doing that. And I have a great answer. And he says, shouldn't, shouldn't you be doing that to improve your relationship with God and to be able to teach other people? And I think that's sometimes the disconnect. We think that it's all about us sometimes, and we don't realize, hey, God has shown me all this grace and all this mercy. It's my job to show it to other people. And we sang the song, you know, we are his tongue, we are his hands, we are his feet. And one of the principles I used to teach, and I did workshops for companies, usually your company, your boss was your company in your eyes. Does that make sense? You liked your company if you liked your boss. You hated the whole company if you hated your boss. That's just the way that it worked. And it just shows if, if, if we show God's grace and people see that, they're going to love God. If we're only focused on God's wrath and his justice without God's grace and his love and his compassion and his mercy, then they're going to say, why do I want that? You know, I, I want to see it in action. And that's so important for us to go out when we leave a building like this. Brian and I work at trying to make the lessons practical when we can. When we leave the building, we go out and try to live it. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be able to live all the things that we suggest. But if you just go out with the attitude that the message wasn't supposed to be left in the building. The message, as we're going to our daily Bible reading, is not supposed to be ended when we shut our Bibles and read our 10 verses for the, for the day. Our, 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 the real focus is being the light to the world. Okay? Anything else on lesson number one? Oh, some, uh, Phil has one. Great lessons that you've learned this quarter. Somebody else has had to have learned a good lesson this quarter. All right, Joe has one too. Phil, right there. As a Christian, usually my first concern is my weakness and how to overcome it and manage it. But in this class, I was, I was shown that grace is what God really wants to be going on in my life, where the focus needs to be, where the work needs to be, and the change needs to be. Not so much in my weakness, but God's, in 2 Corinthians, it's either chapter 4 or 5, he talks about the grace of God that shows, shown to our hearts in our weakness. And I think Paul exemplified that, but it's hard for me to learn to do that yeah. and, and be an exponent of grace and not yeah. worry about all the other law-keeping issues and the guilt yeah. from all that. Yeah, grace is, is magnified in weaknesses, but how many people like to think about their weaknesses or even think they have weaknesses? And once you think you have a weakness, what do you want to do? You want to work to overcome it. And that's been our whole life focus, whether it be athletics or whether it be uh, school, whatever it is. I have a weakness I want to overcome. I was just reading something Michael Jordan today, this week, and he said, when someone told me something was a weakness of mine, I wanted to make that my strength. And he worked really, really hard to do that. It's different as a, as a Christian, right? We have to rely upon God to help us overcome those weaknesses and help us through those weaknesses. And in those weaknesses, even if we never, or he removes those weaknesses, like Paul, the thorn in the flesh. So those are good lessons to learn. Joe? Um, so I, I have a general belief that, you know, I don't have to know. I just have to believe in, in that, that God knows. And this, this, this quarter, this topic has really strengthened that. It's another avenue to sort of look at that and know that I don't have to depend on me. I have to do work, yes. I mean, that I can't escape that. But when things fail, when I don't do what I'm supposed to, when they don't turn out like I want them to, want them to be, I can rely on God's grace. Uh, and to know that He knows. And, 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 and that sets you free, you know, from a perspective of absolute condemnation. Uh, you know, of, of consider, oh, I messed up. Oh, I messed up. So this was an, uh, a good course in helping me remember that. All right, very good. Tom has one down here. Anybody else has a mic? We have an extra microphone. You raise your hand now. We can be ready to go when the time comes. Go ahead, Tom. Um, just that God is sovereign. No matter how um, I want to make myself not worthy of His grace, He said that I am worthy, and He, he uh, demonstrated that through Jesus. So yeah. it's, a, it's a struggle, but that's the lesson that I've learned. Yeah, very good, very good. I think all those are wonderful, wonderful lessons to learn. One of the things that we've talked about over and over and over again, we, do we as Christians, are we supposed to do good works? Yes. We've, after we've become a Christian, we've been created for good works. 
right? But we've, we've noted multiple times in this class that we got to get it in the right order. So we think that we have to do all these works and be perfect, and then somehow God's going to view us as worthy of His grace, give us His grace. And the, the fact is, we're unworthy. We get the grace of God, and then because we have God's grace and we've been forgiven of our sins, then we uh, appreciate that and we, we, we do good works because of that. It's, it's, it's the motivation. It's getting it in the right order that's so important. And it's so hard because it's opposite of how we do everything, almost everything else in our life. We want to earn it first, right? We want to save the money so we can have the retirement. We want to do all this, this stuff ahead of time. So all those are, are really good. Another one that I came up with, it really hit me in the lesson that God's grace is the power to overcome sin now. Okay, so sometimes I think we think God's grace, all God's grace is really just to forgive sins, right? And he's got, he does that when we're, we become a Christian and we accept him. He forgives all of our sins, right? He forgives them all. And, and then we, if we walk in the light, John tells us in 1 John, and we sin, what do we do? We confess our sins. We, we, when we want to walk in the light, we confess our sins. And what does he do? He's faithful to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And if we, ha- if we leave grace there, we're missing a huge part of it. Grace is God's power every single day to help me not just forgive my sin, but to help me want to stop sinning. That's huge to me. Because if I rely upon God's grace, to the Philipp- Paul talks about in Philippians, that God can make us both to will and to do for His good pleasure. God's grace can help you want to do the right thing and stop wanting to do the bad things. That's huge. Because if I, oh, if I can't get rid of the, all the bad desires I have, and I have them continually, and they get stronger all the time, it's going to be so hard to rely on God's grace. If God's grace gets rid of those, helps me maintain those, and put them in a godly perspective every day, and then helps me have a desire for godly things and to fill those bad things with godly things, boy, that's going to be a lot easier in my life, right? And so having that knowledge that God's grace doesn't just forgive sins, God's grace helps us stop wanting to sin and overcome those sins every single day. Who has the microphone? Brandon. All right, Brandon. Something that's helpful for me to be reminded of pretty frequently is that it's not a constant moving in and out of God's grace and in and out of God's love and acceptance. It's that... I can have confidence that I'm still in it, and it's not, oh, I messed up. I'm now immediately out of it. I've got no hope again until I go back and run. Yeah, very good point. I think so many times we live with this idea, one mess up, and God's just ready to pour out his wrath on me and plaster me a good one. And that's not how it works, all right? If, as long as we don't want to sin and we're walking in the light, we're all going to sin God's grace is for us because we're walking in the light. We've accepted it. We don't want to sin anymore. We're trying to live a different life. The life that when we were raised in baptism to walk a new life, right? We were created a new creature. And that's what our desire is. So it's not like we don't, we don't have to fear losing our salvation, right? That's going to be the question. The last question that we have for, the, for today deals with that. Herb? Oh. This was hard because both questions, one and two, uh, the greatest lessons and the most helpful so I'm just going to answer, answer this. Answer question number two if you want. Whatever answer Well, I'm going to answer want. one. Maybe I can answer Well, I'll just answer one. But what the, uh, the greatest lesson is that God's grace is there to remind me that he can redeem all of me, even those parts that I struggle with the most. All right. Very good. All right. Jason? Um, I mean, this is kind of building on, uh, on the point you made, and it made me think of this situation. Y'all knew my dad. My dad passed away. When my dad passed away, he spoke to my sisters and I, and he said to each of us individually, take care of your mother. That was a command from my dad. <laughs> we each took that to mean something different. And believe me, mom can take care of herself, but we each took that to mean something different. One of the things it took to me is I say goodnight to my mother every night. I can count in the four years we were talking the other day, in the four years since my dad passed away, less than a week that I have, less than seven days that I haven't spoken to her. If I did that because I was checking a box saying, okay, dad told me to do this, I'm doing this, it's done, 
she would not love me and she would not be happy. She would still love be, you. Because I would be calling her out of obligation, right. out of, yeah. uh, instead, I'm calling her because I love her. And when dad asked us to take care of her, he knew that the foundation of his request was that we loved our mother. And, and so me doing that, me following my dad's command is sheerly out of love, both for him and for her. And that's kind of the point I think you were making earlier. Good point. Very good analogy. It's not because I have to. It's because I, I love my mother. We don't do what we, have, we do for God because we have to, right? And sometimes we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's, a, there's a certain nobility of doing something when we don't feel like it or want to, but that's not the course of how we live our life, right? We want to serve God. We want to do what God wants us to do because we realize what we, how, how much blessings we have through His grace. So we'll go ahead and go into question number two. You can repeat something in question number one if you'd like. What did you find most helpful in this class? I'll start us off. To me, and that's why I shared it with you, one of the things that I like is just the analogy of lenses. When I look at the Bible, I've always liked that analogy for faith and works. You know, are we saved by faith? Yes. Do we have to do works as well? Yes. Putting both those lenses on helps me understand the Bible better. And so I think looking at Bible with the Bible with pure lenses and the lenses that God wants us to look through the Bible with will help us in all subjects we study. So that's one reason I wanted to share that with you. So what else did you guys find helpful? So nothing was helpful in this class other than... All right, Herb's got one and Joe's got one too. All right, we'll get to at least two more. This may sound strange, but the most helpful thing was that I can say out loud that I'm saved by grace, and I don't have to look around and wonder who's listening. Okay, very good. All right. We'll get, we'll, yeah, we'll get back to that in the last question as well. Joe? One thing that was very helpful, uh, I think, and maybe this is a bit academic, is just the structure of how this was done with cases that, that got us sort of synced on, a, on an idea. But more so than that is the conversations and the discussions and the comments that, that this is so, it's not nebulous, we can apply it. Okay. That I heard a variety of people say a variety of things that resonated with me as we went through the quarter. So it's not a academic thing. It's something that we can walk outside this building and, and show grace. Okay, very good. And I think one of the things that we struggle with sometimes as teachers is to have a balance of presenting material that we've studied to help you guys understand Scripture better. But we also realize in this room there's a whole bunch of good resources. Right, So there's a whole bunch of smart people who have studied the Bible and who've lived it. And sharing that with one another is helpful. So always trying to reach that balance of sharing our own life experiences as it appears to Scripture and teaching at the same time is always a, a challenge for us. I think Randy and then Phil. Yeah, I liked that uh, concept that was brought out that grace is not just at the end to get you over the finish line. It's every day. It helps me realize how much God is doing for me every day. That yeah, is very good. So yeah, God's part of our life every single day. When we wake up, He's there. He's there all day long with us. He walks with us. He, he takes care of us. And so we got to realize that as well. All right, Phil? Um, you know, when I think about grace, I think about all the other things God is. And one of the things we've mentioned in class was that we have a tendency to take one attribute of God, elevate it, uh, by itself, remove everything else from it and make God into an idol. We don't want to do that with grace either. I, so I it's agree. a real challenge to, to accept God's grace for myself unconditionally, to accept the grace of God, which says my performance is not the issue here. It's God's grace that's the issue. And that that's what he wants to showcase in our life. When we grew up under this idea of the law or religion or of some kind that we had to serve it, rather than the God behind it, mm. it changed everything. And so helping to balance out love and grace and law and all the other things really helped. But, you know, Jesus is that true picture of grace upon grace. And that's what he wants to showcase in us. That's different from us trying to manufacture it by our own obedience. Yeah, by our excellent own. point. I mean, I think one of the things as we studied Philippians and we I, talking more and more about Paul, we're going to have a lot of time to talk about Paul this, this next year with our daily Bible reading. When he says, 
I, I determine not to know anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because Jesus is the ultimate example of not only accepting, but being God, Christ's grace in the world, right? And so the more that we study the life of Jesus, the more we're going to know how this works. And so that's an important aspect of it. Debbie, go ahead. What I found most helpful was the case study examples. Okay. I thought it was um, interesting each week to have a different one and to hear people's take on everything. So that's right. what I found very interesting. All right. I, I'm, I think I'm having lunch with Edwin on Tuesday. I'll tell him that the case studies were a success. He just came out with another book on Genesis recently. Larry, and then I'll, we'll have to move on. I think. Yeah, so um, what I've learned that I really hadn't acknowledged before so much was that Spiritually speaking, God's grace is greater than my faith. Um, as a believer in God and in Christ, m my faith isn't probably unlike a lot of people's, that it, it wanes, it's strong sometimes, it's weak sometimes, just like all of God's people. Um, but what I find is that no matter what, no matter how... You know, the devil wants us to live in self-condemnation. Absolutely. And, and that's, he'd love for us to stay there. And, but what I find is that his grace is much greater than anything I can come up with. Mm. It's greater than my faith. It's greater than my obedience. It's greater than anything Larry has. And that's important to me. It's always there when you wake up and when you lie down. It's there. Isn't that such a comforting fact that it's, it's not... Our, our salvation isn't dependent on, solely on us or even mostly on us, right? We have to surrender to God, but it's not... Just If you had to save yourself, where would you be? I mean, I, lost would be... What, how, how would you be feeling every day? Lost and just, you know, you know just like don't know what to do and just overwhelmed. Living in fear that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to hell every day of your life. You're living in fear. You're going to go to hell. That's not what God wants for us, right? He wants us to accept His grace Believe in Him, do what He wants us to do, but understand that. One thing that I liked, and I'd like to get your feedback on this, is I liked looking at different stories in the Bible where we normally only look at those stories from God's wrath and see how much God's grace is actually in those stories. I mean, I, I find that to be very helpful. We looked at Nadab and Abihu, and we think, oh, fire from heaven, kill Nadab and Abihu, God's wrath. But God's wrath should have killed everybody, right? There's a lot of them were doing that wrong thing. Aaron was doing the wrong thing. And at the end, he gave grace and said, yeah, you don't have to do that because you've had a bad day, basically, is what it came out to. Uh, I, I gave a lesson recently with a Korah. You look at Korah and God opening up the earth and swallowing them. Oh, God's wrath. Look at that. You don't do what God wants? Boy, the God, earth might swallow, swallow you up. But how many times in that story did God give them a second chance and allow them to get away from the tents? and allow them to do what God wanted. You know, see what I'm saying? And so that leads me to another thing. One of the things that really strikes me is that God is so eager and so desirous to show us His grace, and He's so hesitant to show us His wrath. And we see that all through the Bible we, if we read it with the right lenses. Even at the end of the Old Testament, what does he say? I've sent prophet to prophet to prophet to prophet to warn you because I didn't want it to come to this. But because I've warned you so much and you still are rebellious to me, you're going to be, have to be carried into captivity. So God goes out of his way to give us second and third and fourth chances to help us pick up our life again and give us new starts. I mean, God isn't the God of second starts or new beginnings. He is the God of a whole bunch of new beginnings because we've all needed more than two, right? <laughs> You ever need more than two beginnings? You ever just mess up? No, I, I got to start over here. And every time, what is God doing? He wants to help you. He's wanting to show His grace. And that's just a huge thing to me. So uh, we started lesson with question number three already. How has your view changed? Anything? And, and, I, and that really is sort of my answer to question number three. And I used some of the, one of the verses Tom that shared with us. I put those in the bulletin at one point. God describing Himself. Exodus 34 and verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, 
who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the father and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth in worship. So does God punish iniquity? Yes. But what's the overwhelming sense of that passage? He doesn't want to. He wants to show us his loving kindness. And as long as we accept his loving kindness, we don't have to see the, the, the wrath and the punishment for iniquity. Does that make sense? All right, Jason. I think the, the view that has changed for me is the power of grace. And, and, and I say that in this sense. We all think of God's power. And when somebody says God's powerful, you think either, oh, yeah, he created the heavens and the earth. Or you think he has the power to destroy it all with the snap of his fingers. If his power to create and his power to destroy are, are that massive, how massive is the power of his grace? And, and, and I think that's what changed in me to, to, to allow me to have that understanding of how powerful grace truly is, both the grace that God offers us and how powerful it can be, again, because I told you the important lesson was us being God's grace, how powerful when we emulate that grace we can be in spreading God's word. Yeah. How much power does it take to change a stubborn person's heart? Can God do that? Yes. Has God done that? Yes. Has God done that in your life? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, God has changed all of our hearts to give up our own desires and our own wants and our own wishes. Put other people above ourselves. The Philippians 2 passage that we talked about. The mind of Jesus. Consider other people more important than yourself. Look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's the mind that, that grace and God has the power to do in our lives. To change us completely. And, and, that is, and we've seen it in our own life. We've seen it in people that we come in contact with on a regular basis. So let's go ahead and go to question number four. Does somebody have a microphone? All right. All right. So question number four is... What passages helped you understand grace the most this quarter? All right, we have a couple down here at the beginning. At the front. Rachel. Rachel first, and then her. Uh, Romans 7, 21 through 25. Uh, so I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of, this, of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man, what that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. All right, Romans 7, um, I have on my list too. I mean, you have this idea where even Paul had the struggle with a, the carnal desires of this fleshly self, right? And we think that we're going to escape that somehow entirely, and we're never going to have bad desires again. We're wrong, right? And it was, it's God's grace that helps us overcome those things. And it doesn't... We have a tendency sometimes of writing ourselves off. I think Larry pointed this out. that we, we, The devil wants us to live a life in self-condemnation, right? And so he wants you to keep condemning yourself. Mm. Well, first of all, he wants you to keep doing the same sin over and over and over again, mm. right? That's, that's the best thing for him. You just keep sinning. But then he wants people who stop sinning to keep thinking badly about themselves for all the things they've ever done in their life, condemning themselves. And then once God, God's grace helps us overcome that, you know what the devil's going to do is his next move for that is? I am going to send other people who will condemn you. To remind you of your past sins. Right? That's, the, that's how the devil works. God's grace overcomes all of that. And it trumps all of that in our lives. All right, Herb? Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not your own doing. It's not my own doing. <laughs> that's for me. It's the gift of God. Yeah, very good. The, the Ephesians uh, 3 passage there is so powerful. Uh, because it tells us so many things, the Ephesians 2 passage, and it has that famous but God passage in there. This is how we were, but God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, Christ died for us and, and is able to save us from our sins. So that's another very powerful verse. So Romans 7, Ephesians 2 are some of the highlights. Joe? Uh, Herb stole mine. <laughs> he cheated. Um, well, offer him a little grace. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, uh, let's see here. I had another one. Um, okay, yeah, uh, Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained it or already uh, become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also uh, I laid hold in Jesus. In other words, you're reaching for Jesus. You're not reaching for yourself. You're not reaching for your works. You're not reaching, oh, I was baptized here by this person. You're, you're the, the concept of Jesus, Jesus first. And, and from there, it goes to what Herb was saying. There's where your grace lies, yeah. in Jesus. And even in, in an act like baptism, it's not about what we're doing. It's about what Christ, Christ is did doing for, in us for, for in us. that act. So... It is, we're putting on Christ in baptism, yes. right? Yeah, I'm and not so discounting in, that. In I'm Christ. just saying yeah, yeah, it's, your that. Whole, it's your whole yeah, absolutely. Uh, outlook, your yep. attitude. I agree. That's very good. Uh, I think Bible stories, I, I tell you, all they help me blend these things together so many times, is that when I'm struggling with, you just find a story in the Bible, hey, that's how all grace and works go together. That's how my part and God's part blend together. To, to make us the way that we need to be. I told you that Naaman was one. One that we looked, we spent a, an entire class period on, at least a big portion of a class period on, was Jonah. What, is Jonah's, what does Jonah teach us about God's grace? Wanting to give it or not wanting to give it? What, is, what does Jonah teach us? Does God want to pour out wrath or give grace? Grace. He wants to give grace. What does it also tell us about sometimes people's attitude about that? Not so much. Not so much. Jonah wanted to reverse it, right? Jonah didn't want them to get God's grace. As a matter of fact, at the very end, he goes, the reason I want to go, God, is because I knew that you were a gracious God, and you were going to forgive him. I didn't want him to forgive him. And so that, le that lesson helps us understand how sometimes we as people get grace all wrong, but who never gets it wrong is God, and he doesn't want to pour out wrath. He wants to pour out grace. All right. Anything? Well, let me, let's go to question number six, and we can go back to the confused thing if we have time. If someone were to ask you if you are saved, what, how would you answer and yes. why? Yes. By the grace of God. Okay. Yes. Yes, by the grace of God. Are we done? Are we done with, uh, I think so. I mean, I'm trying to do everything I can, and I'm working really hard at it. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just, if, hopefully I went, um, are, we, are, we, are we done with that? And can we just say we are saved by God's grace through faith, and we have, not of ourselves, and it's the gift of God, and the complete picture is that when we accept that grace, we have been created for good works. There's no question about that. Does the Bible teach that we have to obey God? Does God deserve to be obeyed? Yes. yes. Every story, which God, I, I, God's always required faith. He's always required obedience. He's always required perseverance, right? These are things that God's always required. And Old Testament, New Testament. And that's what he requires of us too. But uh, we're saved by grace. And we need to be, have confidence to do that. Now, I want to add another question for you. If you hear somebody say that they are saved by the grace of God, what's going to be your reaction? Amen. <laughs> All right. Amen. All right. It's going to be, uh, we had that as a case study, right? Yes. We don't have to just jump in and say, yeah, but you got, you know. We can say amen, we can say, you know, we can talk about how that works and how that happens, but we never want to change the subject and turn the person who's, who says they're saved by God's grace away from God's grace back to, our, back to good works because then they're never going to overcome sin. So be okay with that conversation. Be okay with maybe you need to have a good step on how you talk about how that works. I'm so grateful that God, through His grace, you know, gave us his entire plan and what we need to do to accept that grace? You know, do we have to accept God's grace? Yes. Can somebody turn their back on God's grace and say, I don't want it? Absolutely. We, we have free will. People can do that. Some people do that. God doesn't want them to. What is Jesus' desire? All men is to be saved. All right. Thank you, everybody. Exodus starting next time. The syllabus is in the back. Brian.